If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, for the first 43 minutes, we just have fun and talk about random things. And then after that, we get into the <laughs> fitness portion of this episode. Here's what we talked about in this episode of Mind Pump. So we start out by talking about Justin's post on Instagram. He was talking a little bit of crap about Jillian Michaels. Oh, snap. Got some uh, blowback uh, because she was teaching a terrible, terrible kettlebell swing. What's it wrong with you? It was ugly. Uh, then I talk about upper body squats. That's right. Squats, the best exercise for your legs. There are upper body versions of this for your arms. You're going to have to listen to the episode to find out what those are. Then we talk about Adam's barbecue uh, extravaganza again last mm-hmm. night. Brought us no food, Justin. It's a cornucopia that he's not sharing. I'm a little angry. Yeah. And then, of course, he made more high-protein rice. That's right. You can make rice, high-protein rice. Here's what you do. You get kettle and fire uh, bone broth and use that instead of water. Voila, 20 grams of collagen protein in your delicious Ooh, rice. more French words. Uh, by the way, Kettle and Fire is one of our sponsors, and we got a deal for you. If you go to kettleandfire.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get 20% off all products and free shipping if you get six products or more. Then we talked about the new Pokemon game, Pokemon Sleep. Apparently, it helps you sleep better. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> then we talked about how divorce rates That's go up works. with each successive marriage. Thanks for making me more scared, Adam. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Then we talked about the new Organifi product that's going to be coming out for skin and hair called Glow. Uh, Organifi is one of our sponsors. They are the makers of all organic supplements like protein powders, green juices, red juices, uh, uh, gold juices, and more. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and use the code Mind Pump, you'll get 20% off. I talk about the secret to longer life um, as described by the people studying the Okinawans. Uh, They have something that they do there that is unique, that is uh, contributing to their long life. I talked about creatine and brain damage. Uh Uh-oh. Does it give you brain damage or does it it protect against brain damage? You'll have to listen to the episode to find out. Um, And then we get into the fitness portion of this episode. The first question, uh, do we teach clients to do pull-ups or do we just keep them on the lat pull-down machine? We get into a great discussion about how to get yourself to do pull-ups more effectively or in other words, how to get stronger at doing pull-ups. The next question was training volume versus training intensity. What's the difference? What does volume mean? What does intensity mean? And how are they related? The next question, this person always craves something sweet After their meals, is it because their meals are quote unquote too healthy? Is it because they're under eating or is there something else that's going on? We give our advice and strategies on how to deal with the situation. And the final question, we give our opinions on DEXA scans. A little bit of a debate in that one, uh, but great discussion in that part of this episode. Also, if you're listening to this episode, when it drops, you have a few hours left for our MAPS hit sale. It's 50% off right now. Only a few hours left. Here's what you got to do. Go to mapshit.com and use the code HIT50, H-I-I-T-5-0 for the discount. By the way, mapshit.com is spelled M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T. Now, remember, this program is our most effective fat-burning program in the short term. You got time. Summer's around the corner, and it's 50% off. Do not miss out on this promotion. Do it now. Who cut your hair this time? Bro. Oh, what's going on over there? Let me tell you. You know what? What's going on over there? I don't, you know, my face is cold. That's what's happening. <laughs> your face is cold. It feels cold. No, yesterday I would go to my my she, local. She brought it in tight today. Yeah, I went to my local Real super... tight. No, no, no. I like it. Let me tell you a story. I went to my local <laughs> supercuts and uh, I walk in <laughs> and the uh the the lady that cuts my hair usually wasn't there. Oh god. Um, we, don't don't just, worry, I didn't get my hair. The, the the what's her name, lady? The, the old lady, the one with the eyes that do the diff- opposite thing. Yeah, the, the one side. that you should be like. You know, I'm gonna wait for the next one. Yeah, <laughs> the one that looks like a chameleon a little bit. Yeah. Nice lady. She <laughs> yeah. just, I just, I, I know she could see me in front of her and someone behind her at the same time. Yeah, but then your, f- your fades like one side's up, one side's down. It's just not good yeah. for that, right? But anyway, there was a dude there, and he was kind of like a cool looking dude. He had kind of like. Tattoo kind of coming up his neck a little bit. He had the cool haircut. <laughs> little, little hipster guy. Yeah, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to have him cut my hair. And so he did a good job, bro. He faded it nicely. He spent his time on it. Whatever. But, but he said, how short do you want it? And I said, uh, I don't know. Cut like an inch off the top. So it's a little short. So it looks super clean. So that promote that 
inspired me to shave my face too. Yeah. Yeah, you're so right. very youthful. Today. I just took it too far, I think. Yeah. <laughs> to baby face uh, McGee over here. Yeah, so I was, you know, I, I, this morning when I was shaving my face, Jessica was still sleeping, so I shaved my face, and then I go in the covers and I, you know, kiss her. She, she could feel. She's like, "What?" I'm like, "We can role play today." I'm the, <laughs> I'm the other guy. I'm the, I'm the kid. I'm the other guy. Yeah, you just got home from school. Yeah, you be the milf. I'll be the kid. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Somebody's been naughty today. Yeah. I need help with my homework. Yeah. Did you see? Did you uh, help me? Did you see Justin's post yesterday? Stirring it up. Oh, uh, dude, it went, it went crazy. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, it's still going. I mean, we talked about it in the episode, and then I'm like, well, you know, I should probably give them a visual because, like, I didn't even know that existed in, until somebody like pointed me in that direction, and so I was like, oh my god, like I have to share this. Like, I just felt like compelled to share. Uh, that monstrosity that 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 was there in that video. So there's, it's important that we tell the audience what we're talking about. So there's a, a workout video. I don't know how old it is. How old would you say it is? Yeah. See, that's the thing. I don't know how old it is. I just found the YouTube video. Okay. It. So it's Jillian Michaels, who's um, I I would say probably the most well known celebrity type trainer. Probably right, right? up yeah. there right now. Yeah, she has to be one of the most well known. She was the trainer on the the Biggest Loser and whatever. She's made a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's a workout video of her teaching like this group class, and she's using a kettlebell. And the form that she's teaching is not just <laughs> it's comical wrong. Yeah, it's, it's comical. the it's actually it's like she made it up. Well, it's she's literally doing the stuff you're not supposed to. It's like yeah. if you think of an ex like bench press, uh, form on a bench press, keep your shoulders down, chest high. Bring the bar down, press it up, whatever, and then think of the things you should definitely not do when you bench press, like yeah, like like bring your butt off the bench and and balance on the top of your head or and roll your shoulders. Forward. Yeah, have one hand supinated, one hand pronated, right? Like stuff that you just shouldn't do for sure. Yeah, that's what she did with the kettlebell swing in this yeah. in this video. I mean, it's just like a gross like display of of. Act, like an accident waiting to happen. Like the, mm. this is something that somebody's definitely going to get an injury doing if they're going to increase the weight. If, even if, even if you practice that technique uh, at your best ability, it's well, going to compromise your back. So I'm just like, no, I, there's no excuse for this. Yeah, and you, you posted it, and then you got didn't you get some people who were like, stop shaming her, blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, and I think it was more of like, well, this is old, and you know, and I, she's grown, and have you seen lately? Like, what's I'm, I'm like. Okay, so now, like, I, I do definitely like acknowledge that people grow, and I and I know that like bad information is something that we talk about. We've gone through as personal trainers, like, okay, I, that was probably a bad idea, but I've never put somebody in a position where it's going to hurt them. Right, and that's something that's like been a core value of mine since I've started day one. Plus, who cares? She's Jillian Michaels. First of all, she's I don't know a hundred fifty thousand times bigger than we are so we're talking shit about this so we're not bullying anybody yeah and number two it's a joke yeah it, exactly cares. i was trying to be tongue-in-cheek and like yeah. just just be like oh my god like this is like amazing yeah. like, <laughs> like somebody I, would put this out there i actually when i was reading the you were at like uh i want to say you were like 380 or 400 comments somewhere in that range mm-hmm when I was reading the comments, uh, and when I, at the point that I had read it, you actually didn't get any any shit. You yeah. must have got it later. It must have got it later. Got shared and went a little viral, and yeah. so you probably got random people that don't know Mind Pump or anything like that that are coming on the page. And, you and there's know. a lot of fans of hers out there. You know, I'm sure that like defend her like they would defend us if like something came out or like some people are like talking shit, but. The the thing was is like I wasn't talking shit about her as much as I was talking shit about that specific I video thought, and move. I thought your caption was perfect. Yeah, I was just like yeah. like put like punching it out there. Like, hey, what do you guys think? What do you guys think of this yeah, shit? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, uh, I, I, the the biggest loser for me was one of the worst uh, one of the worst representations of personal training out there. That's just the bottom line. I'll I'll say this to her face. I'll say this to the other guy's face. It was a terrible representation of personal training, but it's an entertainment, and I understand why it was that way. Right. If you saw real personal training, it definitely would not be as exciting to watch. When If you have a 400-pound person in front of you and you're saying to them, like, today we're going to just walk Get up and off for 10 chair. minutes, <laughs> yeah. and then yeah. I'm going to take you through some light mobility work, and then we're going to slowly gonna adjust. Try to introduce some vegetables. Yeah, we're going to slowly you know, work on your nutrition, and this entire process is probably going to take about two years, like, 
Nobody's gonna watch that shit on TV. <laughs> so instead, what they show is like yeah, that's boring. you fucking hammer them, you you chain them to a treadmill, you kill yeah. them, you make them throw up and cry, and you whip them with those you, like battle ropes. Yeah, and you beat the shit out of them, yeah. and you destroy their bodies, and it makes for great TV. And so whatever. So you open yourself up to it because uh, look, if you're a trainer and you're on that TV show. I wouldn't be able to do it personally because I'd be like, I don't know how to, I don't know how I'm going to defend myself. Yeah, it's just funny because I mean, there's when it comes to like macro debates and like artificial sugars and all that kind. Of, like, I just I don't really have like much of a dog in that fight. But like when it comes to bad mechanics and and putting stuff out there that you're making money off of, that's like fucking like just appalling. Mm. Like I'm I'm going to put that out there all well, day long. Uh, no, I'm with you on that, Justin, too, because I you know I'm. I won't, and I still haven't, I won't teach an exercise that I don't think I'm extremely proficient at myself. Like, you, you'll never see me teach Olympic lifts. Yeah. You, you have even, to be good if, enough to teach even it. If, even if I can do them, you know, yeah. even if I can do them, totally. if I don't think that I'm really fucking good and I'm even better at teaching them someone, I would never go and teach that. I'm just, it's not going to be in my repertoire. It's something that I'm going to avoid because I know I can't teach it. I don't really. know you spoke French. <laughs> repertoire, oh, yeah. Rep repertoire. You yeah. like that? Yeah. yeah that's no. I, so <laughs> I like it. Yesterday I did a a, a Q and A in my story, which those are always fun. Boy, those are time consuming though. My gosh, oh, I, got, I know you get sucked down oh, the, the bro, void of that. I got. Oh, they take me a good four hours to do them. Yeah, and yeah. I'm just doing just so many questions, but I enjoy doing it because it's a good way. Yeah, they're to, fun to you know connect with uh, directly with people I have on, to on now I can't get through my DM so I have to go this that's is the, the only way you can do it that's the only way I can communicate to everybody is once a week I just I blast through as many of those as I can get you yeah. mastered like the super speed approach to that too I don't know how you do that dude. I do it's well it's it longer every time what I like is how um and that's why it works for me is when I do that it segments those questions I I don't know if you guys know how to do that or not but like it opens it up to where I can see just the people that are adding questions for that question time. It doesn't get blended into my DMs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. so that allows me just to go boom, 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 yeah, boom, boom, one after another yeah, and just get yeah. through them as fast as I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so. same thing. No, I had somebody, uh, I had a few people ask me, what are the best uh, exercises to build uh, the arms, like to build big arms? And it, uh, as I'm answering these questions, it's like totally dawning on me, something, uh, uh, an interesting point that... I think I want to make on the podcast that I think will really get the point across with how I'm, you know, trying to communicate this. So if you asked a hundred good experienced trainers or strength coaches or, you know, intelligent bodybuilders, what are the top three muscle building exercises for the legs? Like what's going to build the legs? What are the top three or four exercises? What do you guys think Squats, deadlifts. Barbell squats mm -hmm. will be in there. Some kind of a split stance exercise, maybe a leg press, right? I can tell you what won't be in there. Leg extensions and leg curls. That Nobody's going to say that those are the best muscle building exercises for quads and for hamstrings. Nobody. Everybody, oh, everybody pretty much agrees these big compound lifts are what build the legs uh, the most if you had to pick uh, an exercise. But for some reason, when we talk about the arms – the biceps and triceps, and you say, what are the best arm building exercises? People say barbell curls, dumbbell curls, skull crushers, overhead tricep extensions. Right, instead of pull-ups. Instead of supinated pull grip yeah. chin-ups, close grip push-ups, body weight dips, uh, supinated grip rows. It, nobody says that. For some reason, the upper body, because the arms and legs, if you think about it, are you know similar. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the legs are a lot bigger. But similar in the sense that the arms are the legs of the upper body and using compound movements will build your arms better and faster. I'm not saying don't do isolation exercises, by the way. I'm just saying that the importance and emphasis for the most effective arm exercises has been placed on isolation movements. And for most people, unless you've already built an, a, an impressive physique and arms, if you're uh, you know beginner, intermediate – Getting a stronger dip or close grip bench press or game changer or 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 a, a supinated palms up chin up with weight game changer gonna make your arms bigger than than curls and, and tricep extensions. I remember yeah. when that came together for me, it was just blew my mind. Oh yeah, what a difference! I mean, that's why my my favorite tricep exercise is an incline close grip bench press. Like mm -hmm. nothing has put more mass 
on my triceps than that exercise. Alone. And you can do yeah. these lifts and, and kind of emphasize, like people think chin ups, like that's a back exercise. I can do it in a way where I'm using more biceps, of course. But stay I'm roll, also stay rolled forward in it. Yeah, and, and and really curl the arms. And I learned this years ago. I had this trainer that worked for me a long time ago, and I, I hired. He's like this guy was maybe five nine, and his arms were probably 18 inches cold. He just had these lean muscular arms. And when I first hired him, you know, I remember when he came on board, I asked him, I'm like, dude, what do you do? First of all, I talked to him. I said, do you are you on gear? Like, are you natural? He's like, oh, no, no, lifetime natural. I'm like, well, what do you do for your arms? They look silly, especially for a guy your height. And he goes, he laughs and he goes, I'll, I'll be honest with you. He goes, I almost never do curls or press downs or any isolation movement. He goes, I was a high level gymnast. I was just going to say a mm. perfect example mm. of this are gymnasts. Yeah. You look at gymnast arms and they're ridiculous. They look like amateur bodybuilders. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember that too because I started get really getting into Olympic rings and just doing a lot of dips uh, with the Olympic rings allowed for me to even get more depth in that dip as well and, and just stabilizing it too. It, bu it built my shoulders. It built my triceps like more than anything else I've done. It did. It's just weird because and when I make this point, I get a lot of pushback. Like if somebody asks me, what's the best, the, the, the number one best bicep building exercise? And I'll say, up, oh, you know, supinated grip chin up and people debate me all day long but if i make the point to ask what do you think the best leg building exercise is they'll never say leg extensions and they'll never argue and they would never argue squats. never argue it yeah it's no different it's no different for the arms and so i think there's a lot of people who could benefit from getting really strong at those compound lifts and then watch what happens to your arms here's the other thing if i do one more rep on a curl i'm lifting what another you know 60 to 90 pounds. If I do one more supinated grip pull up, that's a bot. I'm lifting my body weight. The strength gains are just more profound. And you're also, you, you're also involving two joints that are affecting that muscle. So when I'm hitting my biceps with a curl, I'm just flexing at the elbow. When I'm doing a pull up, it's also stabilizing at my shoulder joint and I'm, I'm pulling from both ends a little bit differently. So, and to that, and to that point also, there's nothing wrong with, um, again, let's say you're in a hypertrophy phase. And so you're doing 12, 15 reps, uh, nothing wrong with doing a band assisted, a band assisted mm -hmm. chin up to where you can really concentrate. I, I used to love yes. to do that. Like, you know, may, maybe I can't get 15 like bicep chin ups because, you know, if you, if you do chin ups with the intention of using biceps more than back, you tend to fatigue faster. It's harder, oh, yeah. right? Because yeah. your biceps are doing all the pulling. You're not engaging the bigger muscle, your back. And so, and your shoulders tend to be a little more rolled forward while you do it. And we did a great YouTube video on this. But uh, I mean, use a band. Get a get get your a band wrapped around one of your knees or around your feet, and and do that. I mean, it's such a great exercise for the biceps. Yeah, there's there's nothing that'll that'll build your biceps uh, more, and there's nothing that'll build your triceps more than good old dips or close grip bench press. Like you get good at dips where you're pushing weight and you're doing those reps and you're squeezing the triceps at the top. Um, nothing. What's gonna? What, what can possibly touch that? So. I wanted to make that point, um, and part of the reason why I want to make that point is I know it's a little bit of con it's a little controversial. So people listening will be like, "What? Yeah, you know." Which is funny because, like, like you said, they would totally agree with the opposite with the with the leg example with you know with squatting and versus leg pressing. So oh, totally, hundred percent. Like if I I I I can't remember the last time I, I did a leg extension on my on my quads. I and mean, if you look at my legs, my legs upper legs are one of my more impressive body parts, but I squat. I squat all the time. I do lunges all the time. I don't think I've done a leg extension for, I don't know, 10 years at yeah. least. It hasn't so. been that long for me, but it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a little while. So anyway, dude, you're, um, you're, you're, I want to comment on your story that you posted yesterday because it's killing me. I know. You're making all this delicious food without us. Bro, <laughs> I, I, I'm not jealous that you have the barbecue because truth be told, I wouldn't use it that much, but I am a little bit now that I'm seeing all this food. Bro, it's fucking insane. I first of all, I'm in love with the grill, uh, but you've got me on the protein rice, dude. Ch game changer. Yeah, yeah. So last night though, I had to make. So I I I'd used up the it's like the, a thing the, now the chicken bone broth, and so we had to use the beef bone broth, but it still was hella good in there, dude. Yeah, uh, but that's been like uh, it's becoming a thing. I'm getting tagged like crazy yeah. where people are like protein rice. Well, I love it because I've you know I've shared this on the show uh, many a times that you know one of the ch why I don't like talking down about protein so much is because I'm somebody who has struggled to hit their protein intakes on a regular ba protein intake on a regular basis. Uh, yesterday I only ate I only ate two times, 
So man, I had like a pound and a half of chicken and then I had the protein rice. So I had a good amount of protein. You it helps the, me boost that. Yeah. You use the kettle and fire carton yeah. and you make your rice with that. And that's 20 something extra grams yeah. of collagen protein cooked into your and it rice. Tastes, uh, kettle and fire. I don't know what they do. They're the best one. Yeah. yeah. Cause I've, they have the best taste I've done, one. I've done the, the broth before in rice. I've never used kettle and fire. I don't know what it is that they do about it. And it is bomb. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, I have to add more seasoning and stuff when I use other bone broths. The kettle and fire one is uh, by far the, I like the kettle and fire one just out of the carton. I just put it in a mug and warm it up. That I haven't tried. You mm -hmm. said that. Yeah. And one thing you could just do on a cold morning, I could see that'd be cool. Oh, it's, Bro, it's it's for it's my favorite. If I'm gonna have a post workout protein shake or whatever, that's one of my favorite things. Is I pour it in a mug, and I might add a little salt and butter to give it some fat and a little bit more more salt to it. Uh, usually, I don't even have to do that; just warm it up, and then sip on that. And it's like a it's like a warm. Well, even before we started working with Kettle and Fire, you got me on the the bone broth post fast because I oh, feel yeah, it's yeah, yeah. the best on my stomach. Yep. Like mm -hmm. uh, when we were doing those longer fasts where it's 24 hours or more and I, you're so sensitive to, to anything. You after. just sip on it. Yeah, yeah. So just like sipping on that kind of helps you get reacclimated to taking in calories because mm -hmm. if you try and slam it with like a burger or something <laughs> like that, you pay for Don't that. Don't make that mistake, yeah. everybody. <laughs> Have you guys tried making your own bone broth? I have no. not. No. You can do it in a crock pot. Uh -huh. And you can get the bones at the store for super cheap, and you put it all in the crock pot. And there's easy recipes online, and then you just let that thing fucking just cook. simmer. Yeah, for, within the crock pot for like all day. And if you want, you can keep it high fat because a lot of fat will come off the bone and the marrow and all that. Or you can skim it off the top and make it more like the kettle on fire type, you know, where it's it's all protein. It's just lean or whatever. But and then save it, and then you can jar it, and you can freeze it. It's just a it's just a lot more work to do it. it takes all yum, day to do it. Yeah, but it's so yeah, I'll just take a carton. Yeah, That's it's all good. Do you guys uh, do you guys see the you guys remember the the Pokemon game? Yeah, remember that everybody remember what Pokemon the, Go, the one where like dude, it, you remember how augmented reality? Yes. Do you remember how crazy that was? It went insane. And, oh yeah, and then like it like completely fell off, right? Yeah. And, and I love how people were like, "This is getting people to exercise." And be active. <laughs> I was like, "No." People were finding like dead bodies and stuff because it would like take you to all kinds of remote places that like nobody was hanging out so there's all so, kinds of crazy stuff. so funny you bring that up sal that like people were all positive about how it's getting people to walk around so that so it, the same creators who created the pokemon go is doing a pokemon sleep it announced in tokyo on tuesday and it's set to hit markets next year it'll turn players uh, sleepy time habits into parts of pokemon games so they're actually going to give you like score you off of uh, sleep good sleep all night long and if you you'll get docked points if you're restless and stuff like that and so they're going to integrate this is good. starting to sound a lot more like my video game idea <laughs> isn't it crazy though <laughs> yeah justin's laugh you're getting like that that salty. laugh yeah that laugh wasn't real <laughs> <laughs> that's my yeah. idea no it's funny it's i could totally see that like uh you, turning these characters into like you're giving them all the metrics of what you earn for the day. So whether it's sleep or like your movement or uh, you know what you're eating, like that would all affect your character somehow, mm. right? So like I, I could see them going crazy with that. It's just a, it's a it's a really smart move on their part as far as like where the I mean uh, last year it was a sleep aids generated 69.5 billion dollars the problem it's projected yeah. in 2023 to hit 101 billion the, wow. the, the, the a more lot of money to be the made. more oh, the more we're tied to technology the less empty space we have in our day the more we look at screens the more the bigger the market's going to be for things to help you relax sleep uh deal with anxiety all that stuff that market is just and what you're seeing right now is just it is literally reflecting the problems that people are are encountering and sleep is becoming a big issue. In fact, uh, sleep issues among kids is exploding. And kids historically have n are amazing sleepers. Like the whole term sleep like a baby. Yeah. Kids typically sleep no problem, but they're seeing a spike in children who are having uh, sleep issues. And I would bet it has to do with the freaking screen time. Yeah. Constantly being on, the, on, the, on your phone or, or iPad or TV all the way up until you go to bed. And not being outside. This is totally off subject, but you just talking about numbers and stats. It just my client just I was talking to her yesterday, and she brought this up, and I didn't know this was true. Maybe Doug can look this up. 
Did you know that the uh, when you get to marriage two and marriage three, that the divorce rate goes up significantly? Yeah, I did. Did you know marriage two is supposed to be like a 65% divorce rate and uh-huh. marriage three is supposed to be like 76 or something like that? Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. You would think it would be the other way around that as you... You would get more cautious, or you're more you're like you're more uh, committed, yeah. or you've grown, and so you're less. Yeah, likely but to- you have a way out. You, like you've established that there's a way out of this if things get like tough or shitty. Oh, yeah, know? look at second is 67 yeah. and third is 74. Yeah, yeah. that I mean, blew like, that blew my mind. Yeah, it's interesting. It, well, it kind of plays into that psychology though. It's like you, you know, if it's all in or you know, like partially in. No, I think what Justin said is a big part of it. I think once you've gone through the divorce, then you the second time around because a lot of marriages stick around because of the fear of the divorce and. I don't know what that process is going to look like. And so the second time around, you're like, I've done this before. <laughs> you're like, I got this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I know the paperwork. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then the second thing is, I, I think a lot of times what will happen is people will get out. And this is not, this is not just true of, a, of marriage. This is true of long-term relationships. When people get out of a long-term relationship, they oftentimes will seek somebody to make them feel better. Right, right. And I they'll, can see that. they'll get and, with and, someone and for the wrong. And they fall right into that. And yeah. they'll fall right into that trap. I mean, my so, mom was definitely yeah, guilty totally. of this. I mean, my my real father took his life when I was seven. Then within a year, she was married again. And that marriage didn't work. And so that's what made me think. We were actually talking about my mom. And she was. I was telling her, like, oh, yeah, she's on her. Uh, this is her third marriage. My first dad passed. And then she married my stepfather, who then later on divorced. And then... Now I was on a third. I didn't, and then she dropped that yeah. stat on me. And I'm How like, long was she married oh, the wow. second time? Oh, uh, she was married thirteen years, I think. Oh, the second... so it was a decent time. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah they were, but I mean, it was t- awful. Thirteen years of abuse, and it was they should have been, they yeah. should have annulled it within fucking yeah. six months. It well, was chaotic within six months. The divorce so made me super gun shy personally. It made mm. me very, very gun shy. I mean, I have a. a, a, a great partner and relationship but it makes me so apprehensive well i could see it i thought it would i sal i really thought it would be the other way around i just i think of someone like yourself or i think if how i would be if i the first one didn't work out I, that's how i would be very gun shy i would yeah. be very like i don't why get into it right away so i would be more cautious so therefore i think that i just assume that more people would think like what we think <laughs> But maybe obvi- that's the minority, though the majority. Obviously, yeah, obviously, if the stats are showing sixty-seven yeah. percent and then going up to seven, that's fucking. The ridiculous. The other thing too is I, I wonder what percentage of because a, a lot of times too when somebody uh, has children and gets divorced, and I could see how this could this could feel. You have children, you get divorced, you're now a single parent. Right. The desire to-, to want a partner to 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 help you through that process of raising kids is. That could be a very strong desire, and that, that was, may motivate that was, people to just get married. That was my mom totally. for sure. For yeah. sure, my mom. My my mom was, you know, here she has two two young kids, seven and six years old, and the first man that came around that loved kids mm-hmm. was, you know, that that was like won her over right away. And you know, being somebody who, and my mom was in her, you know, twenties, you know, young twenties, and have these two kids all by herself, and then that happened. Then your husband tragically goes like that. I mean, she for sure just went right into the arms. She's the looking first. for support. Yeah, yeah. totally. And that's it, that's and a then. big one, man. That's a really big one. And, and the 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 more financially, the more that you struggle financially, the 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 stronger that drive probably right. is. Totally. You know, because if you don't, if you're a single mom or a single dad, more often than not, it's a single mom because the mom typically is the one that takes on the responsibility of the of the children. Bless them. Um, if they're not doing well financially. I, I'll tell you what I have, and I have a partner, but it, you know I, I can't imagine having my kids f- almost full time, which a lot of these single parents do, because the other parent is basically gone. Oftentimes, it's the man that checks out, and so he's either a weekend dad or he's gone completely. So now, single mom, she's a hundred percent responsible for the kids. That's a shit ton of work. Then you throw on top of that the financial responsibility. Then you throw on top of that if she doesn't make a ton of money, it, you're in a it, it, that's a Scary, tough, rough situation. Yeah, yeah. So I could see the motivation to be like, oh, oh, this guy's nice. He likes the kids. He'll help me support them. You know, let's go. Let's get married. Let's commit this thing right now so that I feel secure and that my kids feel safe or whatever. And that kind of motivates the whole thing. So I could see that. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see Did that you guys happen. see the, um, the, 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 I don't know if it's a woman's product or what, Organifi just dropped and released a new product called Glow. Yeah. What the fuck is that? <laughs> it, so, looks, it looks, it looks, 
just glow. Yeah, it looks yeah. no. So the so glow the the product itself says it's for collagen production. So I looked at the ingredients uh, that are found in in glow and and the ingredients that they have in there. There's there's one that was traditionally used uh, for in Ayurvedic uh, medicine for hair strength, hair growth, and then hair health. There's another one. I think it's called. Amla, if I'm not mistaken, A M L A, and then there's a second uh, ingredient in there called trem- tremel, I believe, that all, has been used. In- all things I'm not familiar with. Yeah, I haven't. I, so here's the thing: I'm not also familiar with these two uh, these two components or ingredients. Uh, tremella is uh, has been used in Chinese medicine for hair and skin. Um, for thousands of years as well, and then there's stuff that I do know about, like rose hip and pomegranate extract, and you know aloe vera, which are all you know supposed to be good for your skin as well. So this is supposed to basically just help with your skin, your hair, like the the health of it, the look of it, and all that. It's like kind of like a beauty product almost. Yes. Now here's the other side of it, and now they're marketing it that way. But here's the thing: if you, if there is a product, if there is an herb or a mushroom, for example. That is going to improve the strength and hair, uh, excuse me, strength and health of your hair and your skin. Here's what it'll also do: it will also work on your connective tissue, your ligaments, your tendons. So it all depends on how you want to market something. Now I could see that there's a much bigger market to say this is for your skin and hair than yeah. to say this is for your your you know connective tissue. Intended, but make no mistake. If you're an athlete, well, yeah. you you know, if you're an athlete, the stuff that you, if if for example, if uh, Tremella really has, and I haven't looked at a lot of the research behind it, I just know that, that that they've used it in Chinese medicine for a long time. But if you look it up and you see, oh shit, studies actually show it really does a big, you know, does good things for the skin and strengthening it and you know building collagen. It will also then help your connective tissue, which could be a benefit to uh, to. You know, to athletes and stuff. Oh, so. interesting. I wonder if this is when I was talking mm. to Shauna when she was telling me that they were going to release, like, I, I thought it was going to be a collagen protein, but maybe this is what she was referring to when yeah. she told me this was coming. Well, so far, you know, everything I've tried from Organifi, almost everything I've ch- taken, I've been really pleased with. So far, the product that I use the most is the Pure. I, you know, yeah. I give that to you guys every morning before we oh, podcast. Yeah, I love Pure, dude. And, and it's the best. Yeah, that's the thing that I, I like the most. But this glow is interesting. I, um, as soon as it's, cause it's, it's, I, I don't know if it's available yet. I know you could buy it, but I don't know if you, if you can get it yet. Maybe um, we can rally the athletes to, you no, know, it's available, right? Get Doug? some glow. Yeah. It's on pre-sale right now till Friday, which is when this episode airs. So then it'll be available. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I'm going to, I'll, obviously we'll get some sent to us. I'll have Jessica try it and see if she likes it. You yeah. Know, make sure her. we get on right. Why well, we should have had this already. I, I don't understand why we didn't get it. How do I find out through the grapevine instead of actually having it at our studio? Yeah. What's Always going on? Always the last to know. What's going on, Shauna? Maybe- <laughs> <laughs> What's going on over there? Send us more free products. Right. Yeah. Uh, speaking of of, of health, um, read an interesting article on the 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 longevity effects of a particular state of mind. So there's been lots of like being negative. Well, so check this out. There's been lots of research on longevity, mm-hmm. uh, activity levels, and diet that contribute to just living a long naturally long life. And the reason why these are important aren't just because uh, you're going to live longer. When With people who live a long time naturally, they also have a healthy life during that period. These are not people who, when you go to parts of the world where people just live longer than everywhere else, it's not because they're being kept alive by machines and medicine. They're being, they're, they're, they're alive longer because they're healthy longer. So longevity isn't just about being living longer. It's also about being healthy. And so these are very important studies. We want to look at these to see, okay, what can I do to ensure that the, the, the end, because when you look at the a person's lifespan, the, the last five or 10 years of their life is when they spend the most money on medical bills. It's when they have the, the worst health problems. And so you want to pay attention. Like how can I be healthy up until the very end? Right. And so look at longevity studies. And so they found that they found forever now that, you know, being active daily makes a difference. That eating, don't not overeating and eating a diet of whole natural foods makes a difference. But you know what else keeps popping up over and over again? Purpose. Purpose. Yeah. People I've who read that in, in multiple articles. Now yes. About this. People. So they this article I read was about the island of Okinawa. Um, they call it the island of the immortals um, because Okinawa just has 
this just people just live a long time there. Long, generally speaking, longer than anywhere else uh, in the world. Um, and in in that culture over there, there's something called the uh, it's spelled I K I G A I Ikigai. 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 Thank ikigai. you. Thank you, Doug. The Ikigai way of life which is about essentially about having a sense of purpose. And they're finding this in other, other cultures and other areas of the world where people live a long time, where if people have a sense of purpose, and, and the way they explain it is like, it's like the 101-year-old fisherman who goes out and fishes for his family three days a week. Like, and that's what you'll find in Okinawa with these people. This literally, a 101-year-old man mm-hmm. goes out on his little boat every day or three days a week and fishes. Or... The man in you know Sardinia who goes up and hikes up in the hills and collects wild berries every day for his family, or the person who goes to church every day, or the person who you know has some purpose in, in feeding you know animals or whatever. Yeah, they find this all strongly connected to longevity. Yeah, I was reading about uh, it was I think it was a hundred and two year old guy that was still teaching karate, and you know he got like all the sense of purpose and like just passing on this wisdom to the next generations and and it's so so important and I, I feel like you know in our culture we've definitely lost a lot of um you know really you know highlighting wisdom and people that have gone through things and and you know like the elderly people what how much we can learn from them and give them purpose as well oh well, dude it, it makes so much sense to me because we talk all the time about how our bodies are these adaptation machines and if you lose purpose and you stop working or you stop working towards something, uh, it makes sense the body would start to adapt and say, you don't need to. Yeah, I'm you done. I'm done with this. I'm done with that. I don't need to use this. It just we prunes see, everything off. As trainers, we see this all the time in me- with the, you know, body mechanics. I mean, you stop uh, lifting your arms above your head for enough years or enough decades. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. It just your body just reprioritizes for other things and says it doesn't need this anymore. Mm. Um, and we see this accelerated in like cancer patients, like as they start to die, and you just see like all kinds of things starting to shut down because the, it's ne- it's prioritizing where it needs the most amount of energy, and it just goes all there, and then all the other things start to die off. Well, like, well, I, 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 you know, because I used to train a lot of doctors, I would ask them lots of questions about uh, death, especially when uh, at the time my ex mother in law. Um, was, you know, she had terminal cancer. And the thing that shocked me the most, because surgeons and doctors are very logical, objective people typically, right? I mean, it just makes sense. They're Western medicine doctors. They need to see evidence. They don't necessarily like to speculate too much about woo-woo type of stuff. Um, and But one thing that they all brought up, it, which I thought was fascinating, is they all told me, they would say things like, you know what, Sal, what's really weird is you can oftentimes tell by the attitude of the person uh, if they're getting ready to die. He's like, oftentimes we'll see someone who, you know, they're sick, but there's nothing dire happening, but they've given up and you know, oh, they're about to go. Or mm-hmm. somebody has got this real strong will to live and you know, wow, their odds are much higher. And I saw this with my ex-mother-in-law. She went into the hospital because of her, the type of cancer she had was causing all this fluid buildup in her abdominum and it would get so bad it would block things or whatever. So she had to go to the hospital, get it drained. They had to do a few things on her to, to keep things moving. But, and they did, they did a bunch of tests and they said, okay, well, yeah, your cancer is definitely everywhere, but your kidneys aren't failing. Your liver's not failing. Your heart seems fine. Lungs seem fine. We're going to keep you here to give you fluids. Um, and you probably have a couple more, you know, a couple more months or whatever before things start to shut down. And I remember getting a call from her because I'm, you know, we, we took her to the hospital. She did that thing or whatever. Every doctor's like, okay, everything looks okay. She's stable. I went back to work. You know, at the time my wife went to work and her son, you know, did his thing. And she called all of us and she's like, I need you to come. To, and she said, she sounded very calm. Mm. I need you guys all to come to the hospital. And, uh, we're like, okay. So I, I thought maybe she got some bad news, and she, we, I went over there, and she said her goodbyes to us, like, you know, all this, you know, how, how much you mean to me, and this and that, and I'm okay with this now. I've made peace with it, and I'm ready to go. And I remember talking, and then after that whole conversation, which was very tearful or whatever, I talked to her doctor, and I'm like, you know, what's what's going on? He goes, no, all her stuff looks good. She probably has a couple more months. And I'm like, okay, well, she just said goodbye to us or whatever. Went home and within within a few hours she she passed away. It was really fucking eerie. Mm. And so there's something to this. There was a study done at uh, uh, in Japan where they studied 
5,000 participants between the ages of 40 and 79. And they found that people who reported having a high sense of purpose, 95% of them were still alive seven years later. The people who didn't, only 83%. So that's like a 12, 12, 12% difference in just that measurable thing right there. So there's definitely something to purpose and what it does for your physical health and longevity that I find I'm absolutely see, fascinating. I'm seeing this like crazy right now in, in my life because I we're at that age now where like all of my best friends and our parents are all retiring. And you, I can even see what it's doing, stress, anxiety uh, that it's causing in their life uh, because their most of their life was, you know, their main purpose was to uh, provide for their kids and raise them. We're all grown ass adults and have our own families now. And obviously uh, on our own, we don't have to depend on our parents and haven't for a long time. And then their next purpose was to keep, you know, providing and, and setting up retirement so that they are set. And then retirement comes and kids are fine. And it's like, and then all of a sudden they're, they're kind of lost on what to do. And it, I'm, I'm watching this, uh, mm -hmm. with a couple of my, like, they're like second dads to me. They're so close to, uh, my, me and my family and watching the, the different ones, how they're handling it. It's really interesting to, to watch. And it makes me really evaluate my own life, which I think I've said before on this podcast. I know for sure I've expressed to you guys that I don't think I'll ever like retire. I think I'll always want to be working at something, even mm -hmm. if it's yeah. a, you know, obviously when you get to a certain point, I'm sure that uh, traveling and vacation and things like that will be uh, more of a priority than making money. And it wouldn't be about money. It would be about doing, building something or creating something or having a purpose towards. Totally. Yeah. Totally. For, For me, retiring doesn't mean not doing anything. For me, retiring means I don't have to make money anymore. Exactly. Yeah. That's when I retire, I'm basically going to be like, oh, cool. My investments are set. I don't need to make money anymore, but, but I'm still going to do something. Yeah. I'm still going to you know, drive towards. Uh, There's no pressure there like there was before, but at the same time, yeah, like it, I enjoy what I do, you know, to begin with. So that's already something that like I I'm not like on this course to, to cut that off and be like, oh, now I have to just kick my feet up and, mm -hmm. you know, sit on a beach. I've done that, and it's like I've I get stir crazy after about the fifth day. Like I've I've mapped it down. It's this like seems it's hard to, for me. This seems to be the most crippling. The the people that did jobs that they didn't really love, you know, mm -hmm. they, and it still gave them purpose because they needed to provide and they needed to do mm -hmm. those things. And so those are the, the the ones that I know that are closest to me that are struggling with it the most. It's like they want to retire because I they abs I absolutely do not want to drive a truck around every single day ever you better ever. Better replace again. it with something that you feel driven to do. Right, and so they 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 walk away from these these careers that they had for a very long time that they have no desire to have anything to do with it again. And then it's like, oh shit, what do I do? And you this, can only golf and fish for so many. This weekends just in a points row. to the fact right. that. True fulfillment in life is not about happy. It's about challenge and purpose. Because a lot of people think that. Like, oh, if I won the lottery, I would just go sit in the beach and drink Mai Tais all day. Uh -huh. After two months, you'd want to pull your hair out. Yeah, we, that still, might last. we still need struggle. You, you need struggle and you need challenge and you need... It's funny, uh, people with children, people with kids outlive people who don't have kids uh, because of the purpose. And trust me, kids are fucking, don't make life easier <laughs> at all. No. They make everything harder. Uh, religious people, religious people outlive people who are not religious by four years, studies show. And it's, I, I, you know, I'm sure religious people will think, oh, it's because, you know, God or whatever wants it. <laughs> I, I, no, I don't think that's the case. I think really it is, is that for, for people who are religious, they find purpose in whatever their religion is or whatever beliefs are. Right. And that drives you. And it's not just about living longer. Again, when you look at people who live a long time, it's not that they just are alive longer. It's that they're healthier mm -hmm. uh, for longer. And that's what you want. It's not about living longer. It's about living better uh, at the end of the day. Speaking of which, uh, this is an in interesting study I just read. This was done on, on mice, but I thought it was very fascinating. They took – scientists took mice – uh, and, b mice fetus before they were born and they placed them in a state that was oxygen deprived that sometimes will happen for example to a human fetus where maybe the umbilical cord isn't giving enough blood you know enough oxygen or whatever mm -hmm. so they simulated that to the mice but they also gave the mice creatine and the creatine prevented 
the brain damage that would normally happen no from being deprived of oxygen. Interesting. So th- because creatine has got protective properties on cells of the brain and the body, which we've, we've, we've speculated and known huh. this for a while. So how cool is that? Wow. Yeah, do, you, cool. do, you, do you see us moving in a direction of, of creatine becoming like a regular multivitamin type totally. of supplement? Totally. Creatine yeah. is a health supplement. Wow. It is no longer just a muscle building supplement. It's got antioxidant and health and properties for the heart, for the brain. It's, of course, uh, performance. Cognitive enhancement, right? Because of uh, yeah deficiencies. All of it. And I bet you they're going to connect creatine to longevity as well. Mm. I, I, I will bet you... I'll bet everything. That's interesting because do you remember? Do you guys remember the studies that came out really early? All the scare ones uh, to scare you away from creatine that they were finding that oh, it was in the lining of there's there's some of it still caked in the lining of the gut and like you remember that when creatine first came out, the people that were yeah, yeah they got some bad publicity. Yeah. I remember they did when they first, when, especially when we were we were doing all that loading of the cell tech. I remember like <sighs> yeah, loading up so much of that and then reading like oh shit, like this may not be good for us to be yeah. taking. This I off. don't think I think you could take too much creatine for sure, and I think you can abuse it. I think for health purposes, a small dose yeah is what you want. The, the bodybuilder doses are probably not the ideal for health. But well, a small dose of creatine is probably healthy. Is it kidneys or liver? Like, what would be like the worst scenario if you took too much? Kidneys have to filter it out, right. um, and you largely do filter it out. But if you had compromised kidney function, probably not a good idea to supplement. Okay, that's with a bunch thinking. of creatine. So I imagine that the the recommendation will be something like two to three grams versus ten grams of what. That's that's what you as an athlete, two to three grams is enough. Especially yeah. if you eat meat, it, you, it'll take longer for you to get the maximum benefits of creatine. It might take a month for you to build. Top out your your stores of ATP instead, you know, versus taking 15 grams a day, which make make it happen a little faster. But two three grams a day, you're set, you're good. Especially if you eat meat, you probably don't need any more than that, unless you're just a massively built human being, which 99.9 percent of the people who who would take creatine are not 270 pound, you know, bodybuilders with massive muscles. Your two three grams a day is is probably it. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. Our first question is from Nathan Teal. Do you teach clients to do pull-ups or do you keep them on the lat pull-down? Both. I do both. Um, the The lat pull-down is similar enough to a pull-up that there's strength carryover. In other words, if somebody has trouble doing pull-ups, let's say they can't do pull-ups, getting stronger at doing a pull-down will definitely help them to get better at a pull-up. That being said, the mechanics of a pull-up although similar, are different. Pulling, one is an open chain movement, one is a closed chain movement. In other words, with one, I'm moving the weight closer to my body, and with the other one, I'm moving my body closer uh, to the weight. And when you do them both, uh, you can tell. You can tell that it's yeah. just a different different biomechanic. Well, not to mention, too, like how you have to stabilize your entire body uh, going through a pull-up and, and how it incorporates not just... You know, you're not able to easily segment just my upper body is doing this mm-hmm. work. Like I have to also account for the fact that my legs have to stay super stable. My core has to be fully engaged the whole time and I have to prevent myself from swinging. So all these extra factors allow more stimulus, uh, you know, throughout your body. Yeah. And, and I mean, like if I were to do so, I weigh right now about 200 pounds. If I did pull downs of 200 pounds, it's easier. Than doing a pull up uh, with my body, it's oh, always pull more difficult. Pull ups are way harder. Way I mean, harder. That's just, it's harder to cheat too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, pull down, you can use momentum and rock back, and there's a lot of ways that you can kind of cheat the exercise. Where no, you could cheat with a pull up. Have you seen a, a, a <laughs> kipping, <laughs> kipping pull up? That's yeah. the unmentionable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not. We uh, don't even count that. Yeah, it's not a, count that. That's, that's not, not a, It's not a real pull yeah, up at it's all. A weird. But what I'll do a lot of times to help clients do pull ups is we'll do pull downs, body rows. I like a lot because a body row is pulling my body towards the the bar, and then I do assisted pull ups. I do a lot of those where I use a band. And I hang it off the bar, and I have them step in the band yeah. or put their knees in the band, and then do pull-ups. 
I find that to be the most effective way to get someone. To uh, that's that's uh, that's how I do it for sure. That or what you said, you just kind of glazed over, which is the I think the the body rose is awesome. I mean, mm-hmm. I'll take it, yeah. and this is a great. You know, we talk we we shit on the Smith machine all the time, but this is one of my favorite ways to use the Smith machine. The only time I use the Smith because machine because it has it has the notches every what three to six inches. Mm-hmm. So you know, based off of the level of the client, I mean, I could put that thing to being. Almost, you know, uh, you know, p- perpendicular to the floor to where they're almost standing upright. It's a very so I have a, I could regress it for a you know eighty year old client of mine mm-hmm. that would never be able to pull their body weight up, but just at a slight angle like that, we can practice the the the, the pulling their body their body weight because they're at a, a much easier angle. And then you can just as you progress them, drop it lower and lower yeah. and lower and lower until. In fact, the body row is a, a staple exercise that I would do with almost every beginning client because of that right there. Yeah. Because I could regress it, because it got them used to pulling their body towards something, and it's it's just a functional, uh, it's, it's more of a functional movement. Here's the other thing that easily the most effective thing I've ever done ever for people who want to be able to do pull-ups or do more pull-ups. Get a pull-up bar in one of your doorways yeah, in your do, house. Do one throughout the day. And just when you walk by it, do one. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't, don't do a workout. Like, don't do a bunch of pull-ups. Just do one or two or whatever's really easy for you. And if you can't even do one, attach a really strong band to it and then do a couple like that. And just throughout the day, you know, you end up doing, you know, five sets of random pull-ups here and there. Mm-hmm. And then watch how quickly your oh, strength progresses. Yeah. Immediately, you start responding differently. You know, if you keep that that frequency happening, it's like, and then you go to, you know, just grab the bar, and it's a totally different experience. It's crazy. Yeah, that was the strongest I ever was at pull ups was when I was like seventeen years old when I used to work on the at work at the dairy, and there were there were these you know steel pipes above right above my head where I would be milking the cows, and that was I used to as I had to go back to go get more grain. It was just like this habit. I would jump up and I would bust out three to five real quick, and then. Go back and then feed cows for an hour or two, then come back, bust out three to five, and I just did that every single day. And you got for, hella good at them. Oh, dude, I could rep pull ups all day long. Still, even and I, I used to make it a priority when I was competing and and training uh, later on in adulthood, and I still have n- was never as strong as I was by just kind of frequently doing it like that every single day. Yeah, when for me, um, I used to. I've I've always enjoyed pulling movements. I've always enjoyed working my back, but where I placed most of the emphasis uh, growing up and lifting weights, it was in, in rows. I, I love and deadlifts. I loved rows. Deadlifts I also liked. I didn't really fall in love with deadlifts until later on, but I still did them. But I loved doing rows. I got really, really strong at barbell rows, really, really strong at, at dumbbell rows. And I almost never did pull-ups or pull-downs. I used to do pull-downs sometimes, pull-ups every once in a while, but it just wasn't something that I focused on. And I remember... I was working out at Gold's one one day, and this girl comes up to me, and I'm wearing my classic, uh, you know, wife beater tank top, working out, whatever. Yeah, and of she course. and she comes up and she complimented me on my physique, and she said, but you know, what, and she was a competitor, and she said, but one thing you can work on is your back width. You need a wider. You should work on your lats. She said it's thick, but you don't have a lot of width. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I I, I need to get good at pull ups. So I dedicated from that moment on. I'm gonna get really good at doing pull-ups. And I got to the point where, and I did, I added a lot of width uh, to my lats because I got really, because it's a great lat exercise. And I got to the point where I could do 25 pull-ups. That's the most I ever I was ever, ever able to do. But I did exactly what you're saying, Adam. I would do my workout, my back workouts would always start with pull-ups from that day forward. And then I had a pull-up bar at my house and I would do two or three easy sets of pull-ups two or three times a day, every single day. I would just wake up in the morning, do a, you know, like six, which remember I was doing 20, to, I could do 20 to 25 pull-ups. So six was nothing, but I'd do six. I'd wait 30 seconds, do six. And then that was, that was it. And then I'd come back to it later in the day and do the same thing. And man, did I get just phenomenally good for me at least, uh, at doing pull-ups. But I'd say the best thing you could do to getting better at pull-ups is the assisted pull-up. It's better than the lat pull-down. It's better than the body row. Is, is being able to do a pull-up that's assisted. You can either use a partner and have the partner hold your feet and you kick off into their hands so you get to adjust how much help you get or using a band under your knee or under your legs uh, to help yourself do a pull-up 
or if you're lucky enough to have access to a lot of the gyms um, have it now. Yeah, and I don't know what they call. It's called a gravitron back in the day. I don't yeah, know what they yeah, call it. No, isn't that what it's called? That, well, that was the that, brand. That was the brand oh, of okay. that. Yeah, it's just an assisted pull up. Yeah, machine. assisted pull up machine, which is which. It's not for a leg press. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yes, just, please put that out. Stop there. doing one-legged uh, downward leg presses yeah. on that. Stop, stop getting stop. cute. That's yeah, for assisted pull-ups. Dumb. Next question is from G Griff, nineteen sixty-five. Training volume versus training intensity. What is the difference? Mm, okay, so Ooh. volume is how the, much versus how hard. That's it. That's yeah. it. It's that's a great way to put Pretty it. Pretty much. Yeah, it's like oh, summed it up. All the work that you do is volume. Your sets. Well, your reps. Tell, there's a formula for it. So to, to to calculate what your total volume of a workout is or your workouts for a week is, is the sets times reps times weight. That gives you the total volume. So if you do a five by five of squatting you would, at 200 pounds, you would say five sets, you do five reps and you do 200 pounds, you would multiply that. That would give you the total volume of that specific exercise that you lifted that day. And then you would add that up. In a workout that, and then track that. Now you could get crazy with that and and, and skew it by, of course, Muscle. if I grab a light weight and do 150 reps, it's going to show tons and tons of volume, but it's not going to be effective. So you still have to train within the parameters of what's effective, the rep ranges and all that stuff. But what I'm saying is totally true. That's volume intensity, just how hard, like, am I going super and volume also makes things hard, right? So like doing a high volume workout mm -hmm. can be more difficult than doing a low volume workout. Um, but at the end of the day, when we refer to intensity, we're referring to the intensity of a particular set, like that one set. Are you going to failure and beyond? Failure being, are you going yeah. until you can't go anymore? Type How of close is it to your maximal exertion? You know, mm -hmm. like like the the closer we get to that, obviously we're talking about intensity, and so like scaling that uh, and figuring out where that lies, uh, you know, that's helpful. So uh, obviously, like we get into like the one rep max thing, where a lot of people I don't suggest like really need to go in that direction, but you can figure that out based off of like uh, you know th how close you were to hitting uh, the amount of reps that you're trying to get, and like where mm -hmm. you fell short. Now, part of why I picked this question, too, is I wanted to talk a little bit about training volume because it was one of the most impactful things for me to really pay attention to um, as I progressed in my my training journey. Uh, something that I, I remember being stuck in a plateau for, for many years of, you know, kind of always getting into about the same kind of shape. You know, and I, and I could never, you know, continue to progress, progress my physique and it wasn't until I understood volume and how to progressively overload and to slowly increase volume over time in a program uh, on how I and it helped me bust through these plateaus. And what, what I what I started to realize and I began tracking clients uh, more diligently after I learned this is we, we all kind of have this tendency of ebb and flow in our in our routines. And you're, the, it's kind of funny how the body works and we just kind of naturally gravitate towards a certain amount of volume. And so you would have like, let's say, you know, your first couple of weeks of training and it's like each week you're a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more, you're building, you're building and you're seeing great results, seeing great results. And then you get to a while where you've been, you've been training for a while, three, six plus months consistently. Now it starts to look kind of similar, the total amount of volume that you're doing in your routine. And in fact, what seems to happen is you'll have kind of a little bit, you'll have a week where you have, you kind of dipped. Maybe you missed a day in the gym or you stopped a little short or you, you quit early in the workout or you just didn't feel like pushing yourself. And so the volume naturally decreases that week. And then next week it goes back and it increases. And then the week after that, you kind of drop back down. And so what ends up happening is you kind of average out to this same kind of total volume. And one of the greatest ways to start to see change in your physique, especially when we're talking about building muscle, is to to slowly be able to progress uh, your volume. And the other mistake that I remember I used to make and many clients is throwing the maximum amount of volume at yourself right out the gates. And that wasn't really smart if I had these long-term goals and I wanted to see consistent progress. And that's where a lot of this came from, where I started saying, like, doing as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change is, okay, I'm just starting back in my routine. I want to do as very little as possible, just enough to send a signal to the body, to start to adapt, to start to build muscle, to start to change. 
Therefore, I could slowly build more volume in week over week over week, and it doesn't get to a point where I have to be in the gym for two, three hours to hit those volume targets. And man, this I because I learned this a little bit earlier in my training career, uh, I and I never applied it to the level that I applied it when I was competing. This is what allowed me to move from the uh, you know being someone who's never competed to an amateur to a pro. At rel- at relatively fast in comparison to most people that had had in that journey, and it was because I was very diligent about my my training volume, where I where I started at the very beginning, and then to slowly increase it over time. And we talk a lot about this with our programs. It's why we highly recommend that people start off in Maps Anabolic and then they progress to the other ones because we have built in added volume to those. So. You know, starting off with maps split or strong right out the gates is a ton of volume. Like you may maps anabolic is one of the best programs that we've created that Sal wrote from the very beginning, and it, it it'll it's going to impact ninety five percent of the people that are listening to this show right now. That no matter what you're doing training wise, so sticking to that first. And then go into the next program like performance, which has a little bit more volume than aesthetic, which has a lot more volume and then split and strong, which has even more volume and all those. It's just an it's a it's a nice, beautiful progression that we did for you already that if you just follow the programs accordingly, you should see great change. And then if you want to go crazy, go maps PED and there's there's <laughs> right about it's, all the volume. You're gonna, you're right. Gonna that's, want. Absolutely. That's, that's your that, peak. That's of where you that's can go. the peak. Yeah. But that's a that's a over a year's worth of training if you follow those steps like that, and because we built in the added volume in each program, you mm-hmm. should see incredible results. Now, it is important to to also say this, that volume and intensity uh, tend to be inversely related, right. or they should be in your training. So if you the harder you train, the less volume you can have uh, or handle, uh, and, and again, and the flip, the more volume that you do, the less intensity that you can handle. So if you're going to the gym and you're looking at your total volume, for the week and you're like, okay, I'm not going to be able to do the same amount of volume as I did last week because for whatever reason, my schedule is not allowing it. You can actually make up for that lack of volume to an extent. This isn't always hundred percent, but to an extent you can make up for it with more intensity. I'm not going to be able to do my normal, you know, six sets per body part today. I only have time to be able to do two sets per body part today. I'm just going to make those two sets far more intense. And that switch up oftentimes gets the body to respond. And the flip is true. Hey, normally when I go to the gym, I do these freaking all-out crazy sets of training. Instead, I'm going to scale back the intensity, but I'm going to do much more volume. Watch what happens. Your body will change. Always consider that. So one of the worst things you could possibly do oftentimes is look at your training and think, okay, I can use more, and not just increasing your volume, but also increasing intensity at the same time. That's, That's asking for trouble. Do one or the other see how your body responds, and then continue from there. Next question is from Christy Cav 9 After meals, I want something else, usually a cookie dunked in peanut butter or a piece of dark chocolate or something similar. Okay. My husband says it's because I eat too healthy meals. Is this true? I feel like some people are so perfect and never need anything else. How do I get like that? Oh God, yeah. you don't. Well, wanna, you don't want to be like that. Yeah. You, you, you've <laughs> are, well, you've already. I, I just by the way you're talking, or the way that this question was written, I can. I think I. I might know what the situation is. Now, first off, let's talk about this. This second to last sentence in here. I feel like some people are so perfect and never need anything else. Well, guess who also doesn't need anything else? You. You don't need anything else. You want it, but you don't need it. Now let's talk about what you want. What is it that you really want? Now, if you're listening right now, you're probably saying cookie dunked in peanut butter or a piece of chocolate. No, that's not what you really want. What you really want is the feeling that those produce within you. It's the feeling that those foods give you that you want. Can't Now, identify that, become aware of it. Uh, two things. A, it's okay to want something and not have it. In fact, oftentimes it's better to want something and not have it. Uh, the wanting oftentimes is better than the thing itself. Um, this is oftentimes true with food. How yeah. bad you want that pizza, and then you eat the fuck out of it, and you yeah. feel like shit. Cookie dough always lets me down. Yeah, oftentimes it's the wanting that is uh, that that is uh, more valuable. So value it a little bit. And number two, uh, it's okay. It's totally fine if you do it every once in a while uh, to enjoy yourself. I think you're judging this pretty harshly, and that may actually drive you to have a worse relationship with these types of foods. 
rather than having the occasional one and not thinking twice about it, like, cool, I ate that and it's not a big deal. You're questioning so so much about why you want this, why other people are better than you, why other people can do this and you can't, what the hell's wrong with me? And that state of mind may actually drive you to doing to uh, you know, having this behavior be more frequent because oftentimes feeling bad about ourselves or feeling bad about something drives us to do something that makes us feel good temporarily. And oftentimes it's these hyper palatable foods that tend to do that. Now that addresses the uh, the mental and behavioral piece to this. Do you think that there could also be a possibility that this person, uh, like if I were to look at their macro profile, that they have an extremely low fat diet and therefore their body might be craving some of these fats or even sugars? Maybe they're not getting a very, even though it's rare that someone's not getting very much sugar in their diet, but maybe she's low on sugar or low on fat and her body tends to be craving this too. Sure. Is that a possibility too? Sure. It's a, of course it's a possibility. It's hard to... It's hard to know without looking at your your whole diet and your total calorie. Like if you're eating 1,200 calories a day and you're like, why am I craving food after I eat? Well, okay, because you're only eating 1,200 calories a day. So that's totally true. But here's why that may not be true. Um, after you eat your meal, would you crave more of the meal that you just ate? Would you want to eat more of that? If the answer is yes, then your calories are probably too low. If your answer is no, I want that cookie – then it's maybe something else, maybe something more emotional, psychological behind it. So personally for myself, um, I experienced this. uh, This was one of the things that I really enjoyed about um, when we went keto like a couple of years ago. Uh, One of the best takeaways that I had from this. So I've always been a a sweet eater. Uh, I've talked about having a a candy addiction from being from a kid all the way into adulthood. Uh, I've talked about ice cream, eating ice cream every single night for forever. Uh, when we went keto, I had, I had never seen, I had never felt myself, uh, go through what I had went through. And that was, I didn't seem to have the cravings as frequent. In fact, it was, it was more rare than, uh, than it was common for me when we are keto. Now I, I think that a lot of that had to do with how satiated I was because I, we were eating this high protein, high or not high protein because keto is not high protein, but a, a protein rich and a high fat diet. And so I was satiated and my body didn't seem to crave the carbs and sugars like it did when carbs and sugars were allowed in the diet. So sometimes with clients like this, if they really struggle with it, I dive into their macro breakdown and look at their macro mm-hmm. profile and sometimes I can make some adjustments by, you know, decreasing maybe the the carbohydrate intake and increasing their their healthy fats, and that really helps satiate the, this person, and they don't tend to have the cravings mm-hmm. as bad. I noticed this too because uh, Courtney still had been struggling with the the you know these these sort of cravings at night, and like even after dinner, and we eat this nice you know healthy meal, but. Uh, it, like the meats were were very lean uh, that she would eat, and like there wasn't a whole lot of fat involved. So we started to increase our fat intake with that, and that really started to kind of help and gave her that sort of uh, you know extra bit of say like a satiated mm-hmm. feeling that involved to where it would last a little bit longer going into the night, which was really helpful. I noticed the same thing with uh, the carnivore diet. Uh, that was something that uh, I I found myself. Like, cause I, I normally have a craving for like a peanut butter or a chocolate combo. That's just, I don't know. That's just always something that's like, you know, comes, comes and goes. And, uh, there was none of that, none of it at all. Uh, but I was craving <laughs> vegetables for sure. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I was craving yeah. vegetables. Try, try this out. Uh, eat a bigger meal. And then if you still crave the sweet, then you know, it's probably not, uh, due to the fact that you're not eating enough. It's probably due to the fact that there's some emotional psychological component um, that's that's you know connected to all this, and I think a big part of it is the layers of judgment you're adding. Oh, I always I think your point is the most important point that you made. I think mentally uh, and behaviorally, you have to address that and understand that piece first. Uh, but sometimes, to switching up the profile, uh, totally. what's going on macronutrient wise may uh, may definitely help and assist with that. Next question is from Catherine B. Fit. What are your opinions on DEXA scans? Good to track progress or a waste of money? Now, How much does a DEXA scan cost? 
That's a good question. To do one or to actually buy one? No, no, no. To go get a scan. Oh, nothing. 50 bucks. 50, 50 bucks? Yeah. Okay. Well, some that's some ex- of them, I mean, like Nutrishop does it for free now. I mean, some of them do it for Is free. Is that a DEXA scan with the handles? Yeah, yeah, that's that's not a DEXA. No, the, um, it's like it. It's that's an bioelectric in- impedance. Yeah, that's what right? that. No, is. that's totally different. Dexa yeah. is a totally different type but of scan. You lay down and it sort of scans your whole body, right? Yeah, truck. a, a Dexa is totally different. It's because the bioelectric impedance is notoriously terribly inaccurate. Um, I mean, you could you could yeah, throw it off you by can manipulate it. you totally you can well, manipulate it, it in ten minutes. A Dexa scan is harder to manipulate. Here, here's the thing, though, I, it, and none of that matters to me. They're yeah. Because here's the deal, like as trainer, and especially us, and you, we should all be on the same page with this. We we've, we've been doing this for 20 years, 20 fucking years ago. We didn't have any of this shit. Mm, yeah, it was calipers. Yeah, it was way fucking harder. I had eyes that looked at you. Yeah, yeah, it was way harder. So all of these tools are awesome. The problem with them is everybody gets so fucking hung up on on the number and what it tells you and it's like it's it's no don't use it like that use it as a tool mm-hmm. and a resource and there's a lot of things that that can you can you can do that with a, a the water so the hydrostatic yeah, the, the dexa scan the bio impedance you can manipulate pod. you can yeah the bot you can manipulate all of them and the, and they all have lots of room for air just like the fitbit does just like the body bug does just like your apple watch does they all got room for air and everybody now like everybody tends to want to like tear these things apart and talk about how shitty they are i think that's ridiculous i think it's amazing that we have the science has come this far that we have tools like this that can assist us in our health and fitness journey so use it accordingly now if so don't try and beat it don't go into it with the idea of like I'm going to try and see if I can manipulate the numbers as much as possible. Use it as a guide to help give you feedback that you're making the right decisions along your journey. So a DEXA scan is an expensive guide. If you ask me, I mean, you, you just spend fifty to seventy dollars. Extremely on a, valuable to me. Yeah, I, I, I would. Extremely valuable. No, no, no. Me. A DEXA scan. Here's the thing. I used to dunk for a hundred dollars. Well, yeah, but okay, you did because you were a. a Even a, when I wasn't competing, bro. Really? So here's how I would. This is what I would do. I would use measurements. Uh, and the 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 I would use measurements. The circumference scale, measurements. Yeah, yeah. circumference yeah. measurements. Which anybody could do for free, the scale, the mirror, and my performance in the gym. Well, and here, those are the best. So methods. here's the thing. But here's, whatever you use, you got to use. Well, here's an area where we disagree. Then I mean, I this has been, and I've, and I know on the show, I'm the the tracking guy and the numbers guy, and I, I love all that stuff. And and the reason why it's been incredible for me and my clients. I make all my clients do this. In fact, it used to be mandatory that you used to go until Aaron got so goddamn booked. No, I used to use him for everybody. Yes, it was my clients. Well, you you hired me. The first thing you did was you went and got a hundred dollar hydrostatic way, and I and it was very valuable. You didn't to use me. calipers? No, wow. not at all. Not when I was brand new. When I first started, I used calipers. Yeah. I hated calipers. I think the room for error in that is greater, and it's it's also I'm I'm the person doing it or they're doing it. I'd much I'd much rather have a non biased uh, source help uh, do it. And all I tell them is this: you know, don't eat, don't drink, do it at the same time. That's your job. Your job is to do it. Do it at the same time. Yeah, it's a DEXA scan is a bone density. No, you can do a DEXA scan. Yeah, it's for, for, fat. Bo- it's for body fat, fat Doug. That's yeah, what they're that's what they're asking for. It's yeah. A, it's yeah, it's used for that also. That's yeah. what they're asking about it for body fat purposes. And yeah, you're not going to yeah, measure yeah, unless yeah. you're measuring your, and, for for bone density changes. And uh, yeah. a lot of the stuff that comes out is is all of these all these tools are competing with each other. They all want your business, so they all right. try and put out information to shit on the other one. At the end of the day, the, if you do a body fat caliber, there's plenty of room for error because a person's doing it. Mm-hmm. If you do the hydrostatic way, there's plenty of room for error. Dex scan, plenty of room, buy and pay, plenty of room for air for all of them. So what you do is you do it consistently. You do it at the same time, not fed, no water, no nothing in you, and you and you do it that you, that's your starting point, and then you follow up on it six weeks or four weeks or whatever your time frame is. And and what you do is you go okay, whatever diet or training regimen or whatever I'm doing during that time, I'm going to use this and I'm going to compare the two. It's not. Is it three percent up or down or wrong? It's. Look, am I am I going the right direction? Yeah, you're looking for trends. That's all, all you're doing is you're looking for trends because the the room for error could be one to four percent, which is pretty big. But look for trends and look at your performance. Here's a big one: like when people are tracking their progress and they're trying to get leaner, uh, they stop looking at their performance all of a sudden. You know, I've had people tell me I got stronger in the gym. But I lost five pounds. What do you think? I did I lose mostly body fat? Probably if you got stronger. That's why I like I like measurements 
And I like performance. Measure your circumference. Measure your waist. Measure your arm, your leg. Uh, and then look how strong and fit you feel in the gym. And just be consistent with the, whatever you're using. And look at those types of trends. The reason why I'm, I'm, I'm not super pro all these complicated, expensive scans is because unless you really want to look down to the smallest percent, who cares? Average person, average person, I can see the trend with a caliper. I could see a trend with uh, with circumference measurement. I could see a trend with other means other than a hundred dollar, you know, body weight, you know, uh, underwater, you know, testing or or a DEXA scan. I just don't think it's necessary for most people, unless you're like super anal about tracking certain things. But can you see those trends? And the average person who wants to lose fifteen to twenty pounds of body fat, are you going to be able to see trends without? A DEXA scan or under underwater weighing? Of course, absolutely. Yeah, I think too. It's a it's amount of frequency of using these. Like for me, uh, I I loved using these with my clients as an initial way to really like gather as much like metrics as possible. And so I I tried to as much as I could to remove myself from the error involved in between, kind of like you're bringing up. But uh, it, it was like within you know. I started out like tracking, I would set another one up for the month after and then the month after. So it was like, Once we'd have like an assessment day, you know, where we like revisited these things, but I was doing exactly what you're saying throughout that entire month of like, well, let's check and see how we're feeling. Like look at the pictures, yeah. look at the circumference. It's just, a, it's another tool. If yeah. you, and if you can afford it, I see tons of value. It's again, I'm the, the Fitbit guy. I'm the fucking tracking guy. I'm the, the, yeah, I the geek fat, out on that stuff the, too. So. I love that stuff. It, to me, being a trainer who had to do all this stuff by hand, long, long form, for so many years, I have found ways to de- use these tools to be incredibly useful for how I change programs, change diet, and I've had a ton of success. Now, to Sal's point, I mean, if you're somebody who's not into that stuff and it's it's actually uh, a headache for you, or it's you know too much, or it's expensive, then then by all, you're right, you don't need any of those things. But fuck, if you can afford it and you like that stuff, mm-hmm. the more the more tools and the more things that you have available to you, I, I think can only help you with that. If yeah. it's not well, here here's competing. where I found most value, and I'm talking about the average person. Here's where I found the most value. It was improving to a client that their diet was making them lose muscle and not body fat. Mm-hmm. That's where I saw the most value. Where I'd have a client, oh, I, but I lost. Five pounds on my green juice diet or whatever, and I and I, and yeah, I do well, a body what fat kind of pounds. Yeah, and I do a, here, yeah. exactly. I do a body fat test right. and be like, actually, your body fat percentage went up a little bit, huh? How's that possible? And it's always something you can refer back to when you have those metrics. Which yeah, is that's when I would use it. But he, here's the, the the trouble that I would that I would see clients getting into with regular testing. It's the same thing as regular weighing. They start to tie their nutrition and their exercise to always consistently having to progress, and it moves. It tends to move it away from the lifestyle of just eating healthy and being fit. And so over time, I would actually do less and less measurements mm-hmm. with clients. It was something I would do in the beginning with a client, but after I trained them for two, three, four, five, six years, we weren't testing body fat. We weren't testing circumference. We weren't doing any of that shit. It was all about the behaviors around I, I long-term success. I can't help but think about the client that it was such – this is really, really recent where – and I think I shared this on the show. She competed, and she competed without me because I I did I, I told her she wasn't ready yeah, to compete Yeah, this is yet. exactly the point I was making. And she, she loses 30 pounds. If you measured her circumference-wise, you measured her body fat percentage-wise on calipers, you 100% would see that her body fat percentage went down. Now, when I did, but I, she did the dunk at the very beginning, and after her show, she did it. She did it again, and she actually went up in body fat percentage, even though she lost thirty pounds and mm-hmm. competed on stage, and she was just blown away by it. And it was such a great tool for me to be able to say, "This is what I've been trying to explain to you." Well, ca- calipers would have shown the same thing. If, as the underwater if, if, if the done, circumference wouldn't have, but the, the calipers would have. Yeah, and maybe you know if 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 the, if you would have done it correctly, where if you would have pinched in the exact same place at the same time, and yeah, room for error is higher, of course. Right. Yeah. So uh, that this is an area though, and you're talking about someone who was very stubborn and still went on to compete without listening to me, and still was being complimented. I mean, she was she was excited on the day she became devastated after she got her test, mm. and I told her it's okay, but. 
this is what I was trying to explain to you was that just by cutting your calories drastically, doing all kinds of cardio, you ended up losing as much muscle as you lost fat. Therefore, your body fat percentage went up. Yeah, that's when it's a really good tool is to be able to show somebody, look, you lost weight, but it's not the kind of weight you, you should have lost. Right. So uh, look, with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download any of our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find us all on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal. And you can find Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>